Hello and welcome in to the Vandy Sports Podcast, part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee, joined by Billy Derrick and Luke Wyatt. This is presented by our friends at Anchor Impact. Billy, tell us about Anchor Impact, please. Yeah, Commodore Nation, you can get closer to Vanderbilt Athletics than ever before with Anchor Impact, the official NIL collective for Vanderbilt University. As a member, you gain exclusive privileges and benefits offering deeper engagement with student athletes, coaches, staff, and the entire Vanderbilt community. You also become a catalyst for change, redefining the landscape of college athletics and showcasing the potential impact of NIL on student athletes' lives. Join the mission of Anchor Impact to support student athletes and elevate Vanderbilt Athletics to new heights. You can become a member today and be part of this impactful journey by logging on to anchorimpact.com slash register. All right. We got a lot of change in the air. Change in basketball coaches since the three of us last did this together. That news and basketball season and all our basketball content presented to you by our friends at Wash House. Are you dreading laundry days? It's stealing time from you to do the things you truly enjoy. Let the laundry professionals at Wash House take care of that for you with two convenient locations in the greater Nashville area. Drop off your dirty laundry. Our professional tenants will give you back the one thing you can never have enough of. That is your time. Within 24 hours, you can pick up your nicely folded, fresh, clean laundry ready to be put away. Check them out at washhouseclean.com. Stop in today. Get your time back. Baseball season. We'll talk some baseball, too. Boy, that is a different conversation than we were having a week ago. Is brought to you by the Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company, a family-owned third-generation milk and ice cream distribution company located in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The partnership began over 50 years ago with Purity Dairy in Nashville to provide purity milk and ice cream to consumers in Middle Tennessee. They now serve Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama, Chattanooga, North Georgia. Today, they supply grocery stores, convenience stores, and the Lee household with other purity products, as well as Mayfield, Nestle, and haagen ice cream. For more information, visit their website, mpmci.com. Gentlemen, Easter's upon us. I will break my sweets fast. I will be getting some purity homemade vanilla and maybe some other stuff. Maybe I just get it all at once. That's why I got a gym <laughs> membership because of Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company. They keep a lot of people in business. Anyway, gentlemen, um, Basketball coach has been hired. I think Billy, um, were, were you you weren't on the podcast I did with Joey? Were you on the one with Chris Dorch? I haven't been able to listen to that one yet. I was not, but I listened to that, and what a ringing endorsement for for Coach Byington. Um, you know, Chris Dorch is, as you know, Chris and Luke, one of the more respected college basketball you know experts in the country, and he's been doing this a long time, and he's built relationships with a lot of really good coaches, and. This is not just, uh, you know, oh, let me throw something nice out there to the new Vanderbilt coach. This is a lot of background behind, you know, why he thinks he can win at Vanderbilt and and how Vanderbilt just made it. He said, this is a good word, astute hire, you know, just smart, you know, safe, high floor type of guy. I know we're going to get into it, but yeah, if you haven't listened to that, uh, Joey did a great job with Chris. And then I know you and you and Joey got on. Uh, so, yeah, this is really, I guess, Luke and I's first time to to talk about it. And I, at first, because of the guys we had talked about and because of the guys we had heard about, Chris Mack, Dusty May, um, you know, even some other guys like a Danny Sprinkle who was hot for a couple days there and, and you thought he might be the guy. Byington was a guy that kind of, you know, was under the under the radar and no one was really talking about until – those last couple days, Chris, I know you do, you were doing a good job of keeping people updated with that and what was going on. But I think initially, Luke, it was just, who is this guy? You know, not really in a bad mm -hmm. way. It's just I need to I need to do my research and and figure out where this guy's been, uh, what he's done. And, uh, you know, this last season at James Madison really pops out at you, you know, 32 and four or five, I think. So, Luke, he, he's won and he's won recently. Uh, and, and and it feels like he's hot right now. And Chris Dorch touched on that too, which I thought was good. Yeah, I, I literally just got a text from Chris Dorch about it as we're we're talking. So oh, um, wow. he has put out a tweet talking to Sunbelt coaches. So when we're done with the show, he said your audience might be of interest to that. So oh, I'll nice. tease that a little bit and then I'll I'll see what he actually said when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, whenever, whenever all this went down and I had my list of guys that I had heard and all that, you know, it's never who you think it's going to be. First of all, hardly ever in any search. Uh, but when Byington came out, I did a deep dive and I watched the went back and watched the tape of the Michigan State game. I've watched the uh, went over Wisconsin and a couple of I even watched one of their losses just to see when things don't go right. To me, and I'll say this, and this is not a negative connotation, we're getting, in my opinion, a poor man version of Nate Oates. Uh, I, and I say a poor man version only because he hasn't proven himself in Power Five yet. But he's been at two places that are tough to win. Uh, and you can look at what they were before and even after he left, what happened at Georgia Southern. Uh, and we'll, it's, we'll wait and see what happens at James Madison. But he, he uh, filled that arena. That's something that needs to be done at mm-hmm. Vanderbilt, obviously. Filled it with James Madison fans. So, you know, I think you're, gonna, you're looking at a grinder. To me, he's a grinder. He's an old-fashioned throwback kind of guy that's going to uh, run and gun, shoot threes, be under control. It's positionless basketball. But it's not just positionless without a plan. Uh, and if I think he will defend the threes a ton better than what we've seen. Uh, that's, that's just my first impression of him. And I, I give the uh, – I, so far, before we've played a game, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about the hire, real excited. Joey and I did a podcast, I mean, within a couple hours of it kind of becoming – I won't say official because I think Vanderbilt's press release was still coming after Joe and I were broadcasting, but everybody in every circle was saying this is what's going to happen. And so I think like Luke and you alluded to, Billy, he was on my list. I was told, I think over the weekend, he was a possibility. I think the ask went to Danny Sprinkle first ahead of him. And so I think once they got turned down, that was their their guy, and it all it all happened quickly. All that to say, I didn't have a lot of time to dig into Mark Byington and get ready for what was coming here. And I think Chris Mack was still <sighs> some people thought in in the picture. That's a whole other ball of wax mm-hmm. to to get into, uh, and and maybe we want today. But in any case, point point I'm making is I didn't have a lot of time to dive into it. So first thing I look and I say, well. You know, it's not jumping off the page. He's been to one NCAA tournament. He's – it's not like they're top ten in the country in offensive efficiency on Ken Palm. It's not right in front of you. But the more you started looking into it and saying, all right, where was he? What did he do compared to the people before him and after him? And what did basketball people think? Everything that I looked at and every conversation I had, I just got more encouraged. Every Chris Dorch I talked to, every person I talked to in the industry that had connections and maybe didn't know him but knew about him, I just heard more and more and more good stuff. Look, I don't know if of all the guys on the the list, you know, Dusty May, Chris Mack, whoever you want to put on there that was thrown out at one point or another, I don't know that he was the best. But he might be. And I always look at it as you don't ever know. You don't ever know. There's a list of people that might be really good, even great answers. And there's a process where you want to make sure, and that's been one of my criticisms of Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt has not turned over every stone in searches. It is kind of narrowed in on this is what we want, and this is why we want it. And that may or may not have anything to do with ath- athletic success. And, and that checks many areas, too. So don't everybody out there get focused in on one thing you think I'm saying. Point is, I I feel like this time Vanderbilt turned over the right rocks, and I feel like it turned over the rocks and found a guy who there is a very credible case that he might be absolutely the right guy. That's all you could do in a coaching search, and I think in in the way – now I have some issues and some behind-the-scenes stuff, how they got here here and there, and and I still think – um, I, I still think you've got an AD who is a lot of times more concerned with perception of how she's perceived with this and that than than finding the best coach at, at, at the best times. That, that aside, I don't think that got in the way of her identifying the right people and finding a great candidate. And I, I think they 
I, I give them at least a B plus, if not an A, for the way they did all this and, and what they got at the end. Yeah, you know what this reminds me of, guys, a little bit, is Josh Heupel being hired at Tennessee. Yes. Um, you know, coming coming after Butch Jones, and, and, and Butch obviously spiraled out there, and there was a lot of drama behind that hiring process. Obviously, there wasn't as much drama in this hiring process as there was uh, before Tennessee came upon the choice of Josh Heupel, but, you know, it was just sort of not super high about it, but not super low about it. It was, okay, let's see. Let, let, let's see what happens. But you knew about Heupel, and you knew he was a hard worker. You knew uh, he had won, you know, decently where he was, and you just had to wait and see. And it's not all the time where you look at a hire and you go, great hire, he, you know, slam dunk hire, this guy's going to win at Vanderbilt. And it's pretty, you know, it doesn't always have to be, oh, this is an awful hire, like, you know, th this is not going to work. Sometimes you just got to wait and see. And I think that's that's what Vanderbilt needed. You needed a guy that, you know, not too high, not too low. Uh, and, and it sort of reminds me of Bryce Drew a little bit, Luke, but this guy has a little bit more experience than Bryce Drew, and he's been to a lot of different places. He's been an assistant under Bobby Crimmins at, at College of Charleston. He's been at Virginia early in his career. He's been a director of basketball operations, which Joey has talked about. Um, you know, he's he's had a lot of different hats to wear, and and I think that helps him here. And and you talking about him being a grinder, Luke, is is big to me because you have to be that at Vanderbilt. You, you nothing is going to be given to you at Vanderbilt. You have to work for everything, and I think he he's excited uh, from the people I've talked to. Looking forward to tomorrow, and you know he just it feels like a challenge that he's excited about, and or else he wouldn't have taken it. Right? right. I mean, you got to be a special, different type of coach to be excited about taking on a challenge like Vanderbilt in the SEC in today's basketball league. And it feels like he's that. Uh, again, we'll wait and see. But a little bit of Josh Heupel in this hire. Uh, yeah. But, but we'll see how, how that pans out. Well, you know, what I'm excited about is he's going to be a guy that's that's when I say a grinder, he's the kind of guy that'll have a sleeping bag in his office. There's going to, yeah. until he gets everything rolling. Uh, I've seen those type of coaches win at Vanderbilt. The, it's not a guarantee, but I can look back in the past and see that in other sports as well. And you have to have that at Vanderbilt because you've got to work a little bit harder than other folks. People say, ah, everybody's working hard. That's not true. No. We, we just saw that with our last coach. I mean, <laughs> I bang on Jerry Stackhouse, but what we've got is a polar opposite of Jerry Stackhouse. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're a fan of Vanderbilt basketball, you're excited about that. And one of the things I think that, uh, you know, listening to Chris Dorch uh, that I'm more excited about than anything is he's not afraid of a challenge. And obviously, if you go to Georgia Southern and then James Madison, two programs that were not, were off the map and in the Ken Palm, we're in the 200s and 300s. And then he brought them up to, I guess, the as high as 80 something, uh, you know, that's a big jump. And uh, I, I'm just excited about it. I, again, we, no one knows. We haven't thrown the ball up in the air yet. But I can't wait to get over there to some of his practices and see how he conducts things. You guys said something there that I wanted to touch on. Then I, then I want to shift direction here a little bit and, and start with a question to Luke. I thought it was very interesting that that high up in that press release, I think Candace mentioned something like tireless work ethic. I'm like, that that means you knew <laughs> that you had an issue with the last guy and you're hitting it right off the bat with this one, which was smart. Yeah. Uh, number two, I have heard, been hearing this since December, and I don't, I don't know that I believe it. And let me just start here. Trying to determine the truth at Vanderbilt and who controls what is about like trying to figure out who shot Kennedy or – or who DB Cooper is. I mean, there's a there's there's some info out there you can definitely disprove, but but getting at the truth is is very hard, and there's a lot of debate. And even years later, you don't know what happened always. But there was a very interesting narrative starting to float back in December that for now on the boosters picked the coaches, which is very unlike what's happened at Vanderbilt before. Heard a little bit of that again afterwards. The NIL 
enthusiasm seems to have skyrocketed. Uh, it seems to because it's NIL and you just never know. And there's never any way we can know for sure. But there's mm -hmm. been a lot of, of, of those things in the air. I, I don't know if that's a question as much as it is a, a concept, Luke, that I'm throwing at you. But what are your thoughts there? Yeah, and one of the uh, things, if I get a chance to talk to Coach Byington, one of the things I'm going to ask him is, okay, did you get some things in writing? You know, the verbal promises are this and that. But when you take a job like a Vanderbilt, you have to know for sure. I, I told the same thing to Clark before he took the job at Vanderbilt. It better be in writing because they can tell you anything they want to tell you and verbally give you a you know, smile in your face. And, you know, it's, uh, it's not all cookies and cream to pardon your pun for your ice cream when you get there. Now, I will say this. I think the NIL, I think when you, when you love the coach, when you see his work ethic and you see the product that he's going to bring, that's what, that's what NIL is about. The coach has to sell that stuff. It's not the university saying we got a basketball program and we got ex coach. That coach has to sell himself. And uh, I think that, you know, when you, if he gets right folks and invites them to practice, gets former players involved, does the type of things that, sh that other coaches in the past have done, then I think it's going to be a home run for Vanderbilt. I really do. I, I just can't get over it. And Chris, I know you haven't listened to it yet, but please listen to the podcast with Joey and Chris Dorch. I will. I mean, you would think that. Uh, Coach Byington called Chris and paid him some money. Yeah, I know. Hey, I I have one reason I haven't listened to it yet. Well, one one's time, but the other is because I I talked to Chris for about twenty five minutes that af that afternoon before he did the podcast. So I have oh. a pretty good. I, I feel like I got a lot of the spoiler alerts, and so I, I don't know that there's anything I'm going to hear in that that right. shocks me. But I mean, I Chris and I are very close. I've worked for Chris. Um, a lot uh, and, and known him for probably 15 years. And he is, he is one of the best and the most honest people in, in sports business. He, I've, I've never known the guy to lie. He does not get spun. He is not a propaganda agent for anybody like some people in our, our business have been. And so when, when Chris talks in those terms, I very much listen. One thing that you touched on, I, I do want to go back with, you talked about former, uh, the decision making on coaches. There was a man who's no longer with us, hadn't been with us now for at least 10 years. John Rich, for a long time, was in on every coaching search at Vanderbilt the good, the bad, and the ugly. He he admitted when he was, you know, he endorsed Rod Dowhauer and he said, I knew I'd made a mistake after I endorsed him uh, three weeks later. He said, I screwed that one up. But he back then, John Rich was involved. After John Rich left, of course, John Ingram took over. Uh, I, I'm sure he's still heavily involved. I would think so. There's no way he couldn't be. Uh, besides that, I, I have no problem with the search. I really don't. I think they did a good job this time, and uh, I, I have no complaints in that area. Luke, you mentioned former players. Um, I think that is uber important, especially at Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt has as many former players that care about the program still in Nashville, but I would probably say – Lower than about 10 people were even going to the games. I mean, th yeah. there a lot of them are in Nashville, and they want to come back to the games. They want to support the program. I don't think that'll be super challenging for Byington to just say, hey, look, I, I want you guys in the gym. I want you guys a part of the program. That hadn't happened the last seven years, even under Bryce Drew. Bryce right. Drew was, was a little bit better than Stackhouse about it, but even Bryce Drew wasn't great about it you've got to fully embrace them. I'm not saying you've got to let them infiltrate the program and affect your decision-making. It's just, they need to be a part of it and they need to know that they are welcome whenever they, whenever they want. Luke, you can go over to Vanderbilt football practices whenever you want. Uh, I mean, you could, you could call Clark up, say, Hey, you know, let me check out a workout or a practice, whatever that same thing with Tim Corbin. I mean, he's always been that way. You'd have to be that way in basketball too. Vanderbilt hasn't had that, and it's not hard to do. It 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 really isn't. I mean, there's a lot of them in town, and so I would say, and Chris, you know this too. You know, you know a lot of them. So do you, Luke? They want to be a part of it, and I think that is honestly before even you talk about getting players in, and and before you even talk about winning and losing, getting those former players back involved with the program is extremely important. 
I want to tie two things together because I was having the thought, as you said, that there were people out there just waiting to give their money and their support. Just just sitting there going, just give me a reason. Just give yeah. me a reason. And at the end, those people said, hey, if the only thing I got is to withhold my presence from the gym and sell my Kentucky or Tennessee tickets to opposing fans, I will do that because that's how bad we need to change. When you hit that point as a program, you are screwed unless you do something. And I'm just thinking, guys, can you imagine if we're sitting here today trying to do a podcast about year six of Jerry Stackhouse? Mm. Now, and, and my hesitation for them moving on, I had a few. One was, I don't know that I trust them not to screw it up with the next guy. And I think that was the one thing that everybody was always scared of. Now that we know what what's behind door B and we had five years of what was behind door S. I mean, my goodness, what, what a contrast that is. Chris, if, if we were having to do another year of stack house, you'd have been better off with your ratings to put Andy Griffith reruns on right now. <laughs> Look, you, you heard me say, I'm sick of covering the circus. I want to cover sports for a change. Yeah. And I, I think we get And that's that not now. a lot and to I, ask for. It's it, it it's nothing it, to ask for any place other than than this one historically. But and that's what I think that's just kind of what's interesting about the climate because I don't think that if this had been three or four years ago and the search were handed to Candace, I don't think we would have arrived where we did for a bunch no. of different reasons, Luke. Well, I, I will say this, and, and I'm not making an excuse for Vanderbilt or Candace, but when COVID hit, Vanderbilt probably handled it worse than anybody I know. Yes. And I think that we were like frozen in time. And I think that from that point forward, we almost erased the board and started doing things without thinking them through, uh, uh, both politically and what was best for the athletic department. And you can't do that. You can't mix the two. It's got to be what's best for those student athletes. And I've been hammering on that forever. And also the fact that, you know, you have former alumni come out, and former football players come out and make a comment about to the fans that you don't matter, that the sidewalk alumni matter. I guarantee you Coach Byington is going to want those sidewalk fans there. The old section yeah. in game, you may not remember them. I know you don't, Billy, you weren't born. But there was a group from Madison, Tennessee. There was four or five hundred of them that sat in the corner of the end zone for every football game at Vanderbilt. Called them the section in game. And they were a bunch of blue collar workers that came and supported Vanderbilt and brought their kids up through to be Vanderbilt fans. And that stuff's gone now because yeah. as time went on, they didn't care about them. And that's got to change. And if they do, and, and bringing in a coach like this, who I think is a quote, blue collar coach, that's why I describe him. You know, hey, look, if it doesn't work with him, uh, there's going to be issues, obviously. But I, I think giving, giving the guy a chance and giving him a five-year deal, I don't think we're going to have to wait a long time before this team is exciting to watch. I think you'll see that right out of the shoot. And, Chris, when the news was coming out, I remember talking to you and Joey um, after – I think there was this was right after the Arkansas game, the SEC tournament, and – we had talked about, and I think you said you did a good job of saying Vanderbilt can't make a Vanderbilt mistake here. That they they cannot yeah. mess this up. It doesn't feel like they did that. It, it, this feels no. normal. It feels safe, and yeah. you know it, that that was kind of the feeling with Shea Ralph a little bit. That you'll wait and see um, with with Clark Lee similar. Um, and and let me know what you guys think of this. Candice Lee, obviously, she's got people in her ear. You know, people she'll she'll go to. Um, this was her decision, cor correct, Chris? I mean, I think we can we we can say that. Well, or I'll, 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 I think it's she she led the search process, but I think Deermeyer had input at the end is probably the way I would put it. But it might be more. This one was murkier than some of the other ones. Um, now I don't know if that's fair either, Luke. I, I'll let you. Hit all that. Well, I, I'll just call it call a spade a spade. What it what it was in my and I don't think I'm guessing here. When you cost the department ten million dollars because of a silly extension, they're not going to let you uh, be in a vacuum on a decision. 
So yeah. mm-hmm. I think there's no way that she or anybody else individually made this. There was some deep thought put into this of yeah. who, who, you know, and it had to be a thumbs up or a thumbs down on this coach. And I think yeah. Deermeyer, if it works, gets credit. Candace gets credit as well. If it doesn't work, they both get the blame. So it's not, this is not just Candace's decision. No. And I guess what I was trying to get at a little bit there was, um, you know, whoever has been in her ear on this decision, whether it, you know, whether it was somebody in the department or whoever donors, whoever they've done a decent job getting Clark in here, getting Shay in here, getting Byington in here, whoever those people have been, whether we know them or not, credit to them because we're looking at it now saying this is a pretty good move. I mean, let's be what honest. Is- I'm sorry. Let's be honest. Candace wanted to keep Stackhouse. Yeah. Throw NIL at it. We know that. She wanted to throw money yeah. at the pro. thought Jerry was the guy. So, obviously, that had to be nixed at some point. Yeah, I mean, that that is – that is so ridiculous on its face at this point when you see how fast the NIL has allegedly escalated. I mean, yeah, good good luck lathering stack up with NIL money. Now, there, there's some, there were a couple people out there that would have helped out, but a lot of them were off the board until they made a change. Right. Well, and how, my, I guess my question is, how long can they go with with the way they're they're lined up right now with with Candace? sort of having people around her making the decisions as opposed to her not actually making decisions. Well, Billy, I think this, and I don't think this is just uh, unique to Vanderbilt. I think most places it's a group think. It's not just the athletic Because athletic directors are like anybody else. They have their strengths. I would think Candace would know more about men's or women's basketball and maybe the, uh, Olympic sports, her hires have been pretty good there, I think. And, and, and probably moving forward, she'll do a good job with that. But when you come to guys that are making millions of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, it has to be real well thought out of. And I just think that's the case around the country, not just at Vanderbilt. There was one thing I wanted to mention, and it's not come up, and I don't think I've really talked about it since the search, even on the board, uh, the Renaissance search firm. Um, which is led by Herb Courtney. And I, I don't know Herb at all. I, I I know some people that either know him or or know enough of their firm. And I think that was a concern. They had not done as best I could tell this kind of search, at least based on what's on their website. A search anywhere near this magnitude. And and look, they're out there with the kind of candidate they're looking to bring. But they also answer to the client. And I look for, for all the concern about the search firm. And I had mine too, for a number of reasons, everything I heard, they did a really good job of identifying and put the right candidates in front of people. So you you always going to give credit to people uh, for, for doing a good job, especially when you got some doubts on the front end. And I wanted to make sure we, we got that in because I don't, I don't think there's a lot of, a lot of power five schools out there using renaissance for major sports openings is, is best I can tell. Uh, but, but it worked out in this case for sure. Yes. Did, did you hear anything, Chris, about some of the reasoning behind that or that, you know, how much impact renaissance did have in the search? Um, because you look at it and you go, okay, you've got a search firm, you've got a committee. Um, are those sort of just courtesy things or, or you know, or do, do they have an impact? I've always, I've always wondered that. Well, look, these, these are delicate conversations to have in 2024. Um, yeah. But we try to be honest with the audience about what we know. As it was put to me, that gets the DEI piece of this search out of the way, which at Vanderbilt is always going to be a factor. Now, it may not be the determining factor, but it's always in that conversation. I know that with 100% accuracy. I know people get mad when you say that, but that's very well sourced a lot of places. Um, so I, I think maybe that was a way to um, get the right candidate without – angering the, the mob at the school that doesn't really care about sports. Is that a good way to put it, Luke? No, I, I, I couldn't say it any better. 
Okay. That anyway, the, the the point the point is they got a good coach, and I I don't think in in terms of the major stuff with finding the right candidate, I don't think there was anything screwy about the process. And God knows you've heard my concerns based on what has come out of past searches. I'm I'm glad that they did not do that this time. Just go looking for for all kinds of stuff. Right. Yeah, and, and one more thing on Byington. I know we got some baseball to get to, and then some questions, but. His, his style, his style of play. Uh, and obviously, it, it might change and shift a little bit when he comes to Vanderbilt. Um, but you talked about Nate Oates, you know, kind of being a similar type coach in the way he plays up-tempo, but valuing defense, valuing the concept of defense turning into offense. And you just never felt like under Stackhouse that – this team valued defense enough. I mean, they they had some decent defensive teams, but they never like last year was a perfect example of they just couldn't really guard anybody. I mean, they had you know Mignon was a decent defender, and they had some some other guys that that played with effort, but but it didn't seem like there was a ton of defensive strategy. In today's day and age, you have to have defense create offense, but you've also got to shoot. And obviously, Byington values shooting, three point shooting, and so I think you look at that style. That's a style of play, and there's great videos on it. There's a good YouTube video on, on his style. It's about 10 minutes long. Just look up James Madison play mm -hmm. style. Um, players want to play in that. Players want to have fun and, and go up-tempo and, and run, and I think that'll work well um, at Vanderbilt, in, 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 in that gym, in this system, in Nashville. And, if, and, and you know that's, that's a lot of the reason players connect to coaches guys is because they 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 hear about this style of play and they hear about what what they could do in that style of play and they want to play for it so i think looking at his style um i just think it's something Vanderbilt is needed and you had you just didn't see a you saw good sets from stackhouse but it's like okay it, it's all it's time for something different you know you need to kind of you know go into the the 21st century a little bit i'm not saying what stackhouse is doing was outdated it just didn't feel like something that would work consistently at Vanderbilt. Um, and, and Byington being a good coach who's been at a lot of different places, he will shape shift. So it may not be the exact same style that he, that he utilized at James Madison, but stylistically that, that part of it is interesting uh, to me to see if he can carry that over to the sec. Well, Billy, it's, it's positionless basketball. And I, I don't want to scare yeah. people that because there's, there's different types of positionless basketball. Bryce Drew ran positionless basketball. It was the first time I saw it at Vanderbilt. This is positionless basketball, but with the priority to not just shoot threes, but to make threes. You got to have guys on the floor that are going to shoot between 33 and 37 percent from three. You can't have you can't have your offense geared to make shoot threes if you can't make them. Now, mm -hmm. you know we had plenty of threes that we shot. In fact, we probably averaged similar to what James Madison took in threes. But what we made and what they made, totally different. But the biggest difference I see in what I've watched in the four full games I've watched for, of him, they defend the three very well. And by mm -hmm. that, close out, they're not chasing because they don't have to worry about matchups. It's positionless. You got a 6'8 guy, he's going to go, go. If he's the, the guy that's responsible to rebound, then somebody else is going to pick that guy up at the three-point line. You ain't got to worry about, that's my guy, and chasing and all that. They they have a plan. They work their tails off. They tap out if they get tired, and you got eight or nine guys doing it. And that's what you're going to see. You're going to, that's why I think Memorial will get good crowds from is because when we start playing, you're going to see kids diving on the floor for loose balls. You're going to see guys working their tail in off of the defensive end of the floor. You're going to see some press from time to time. It's just going to be fun basketball to watch. And how many times have we said this over the years? Gosh, it'd be nice for Vanderbilt to win, but you don't want them to have to run the option. You want to be fun to watch. You know, if you could score 42 and get beat 43 to 42, that's a lot more fun than watching getting beat 10 to 7. Yeah. Good, good points. Um, I know we got a mailbag to get to in a little bit. We also got baseball to get to. Uh, guys, mm. wh what are we watching? How concerned are we, Luke? Well, uh, here's my deal. You know, we go from the last game against Auburn, the, the three-game sweep against Auburn. We're all excited about that because I, 
I always look at it at home. You got to win two out of three. That's what it is. And the recipe is maybe sweep one throughout the season at home. Don't get swept on the road. That's kind of the formula to get to 16 or 17 conference wins. And that will get you a regional. Then, guys, we just it's just like you cut the water off. We went from hitting the ball, defending, uh, pitching, everything has gone south in a five-game stretch. We were lucky to win the two non-conference games. We beat Belmont 3-1. We beat Valpo 3-2. And we don't, uh, pardon my language, pee a drop at South Carolina. I mean, we look like – now, I, I don't know. Here's And, Chris, let me ask you, Billy, this. How much difference does it make playing defense – and I know some of these were pop-ups – on a grass field from turf. Uh, I don't know. Your your glove is made of leather, and ball hit the leather a lot of times and popped out. That's what I don't get. I don't either. I mean, th these kids grew up playing on grass. I don't understand I, it at all. No. And, and you know, as much as they say – and, Tim, anytime you go on the road in the SEC, it's tough. But I looked at the crowds. They weren't sold out. It wasn't – a huge loud crowd. I mean, it was more, more people than it's a bigger stadium than ours, but still it wasn't a, it wasn't like going yeah. to play at the or LSU. So I don't think the crowd had anything to do with it. I just, we were poor in just about every department. Yeah. It looked like this team was really mentally weak all weekend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, that Calvin Hewitt error, that was your ball game. And it felt like that was the series. I mean, that happened and everything just melted down. Um, and you saw that at times last year. You saw that at times a couple years ago where you just watch something happen and then it just keeps unraveling. Um, and you thought going into this season, Vanderbilt has the veterans to say, guys, let, let's wake up. Let, let's, you know, let's salvage game three here. You know, let, let's, let's get back to what we do. You didn't see that all weekend. And that's got to change. The, you mentioned earlier before we got on, Luke, these veterans. At some point, the older guys on this team have to step up. Um, and I know they're banged up right now. Sawyer Hawks uh, is is now out for a little bit of time. J.D. Thompson uh, has some arm soreness. Andrew Dukanich out for the season. Tommy John surgery. Um, those injuries now are starting to pile up, and the timing of them are not great. But the timing of this Missouri series is good. Uh, because Missouri is not great at all. So Vanderbilt's got to, I'm not saying they got a sweep, but it'd be nice to get a sweep for them and then get some confidence heading into Baton Rouge because you're going to have to bring it if you want to even win one uh, there. So this team's got to wake up. Um, you know, and, and Chris, we ju we've seen too much of that with these road SEC series uh -huh. where Vanderbilt just melts down. Um, yeah. I, th I think it's a sign of a good team if you can at least win one, you know, but they've gotten swept, you know, two or three too many times these last few years. And it's kind of bit them um, again. I'm not, I'm not signaling disaster here. Um, this team's just got to look in the mirror and go, okay, we got to be a little bit stronger. And, and you look, you're on the road in the sec. It's not easy. It's never easy. South Carolina was hungry. They, you know, maybe it's just a bad weekend. You know, we saw the year they won a national title. They lost that that series in College Station. I, we've all heard stories about Corbin and the 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 flight back and things like that. But we'll see. I'll be interested to see if they go to Baton Rouge and there's another meltdown. They get swept. Yeah. Then those are those are warning signs. So this is a little red flag here. If this red flag turns into something seriously wrong, then. We're starting to talk a little bit differently. Again, not disaster mode right now, but like you said, Luke, you can't make those types of errors. I mean, Calvin Hewitt makes that catch in his sleep. Um, yeah. You know, so you just does, you can't. So does Troy Laneve. Exactly. So that, that's at least four drop fly balls this year. Just, I mean, the the Bulger one back in the Gonzaga series at least was semi-explainable because you're sort of in that area where the terrain changes you know in one spot over here the fence is right behind your back if you move over five feet to your left it's you got 10 feet and and if the ball gets behind you and hits one thing it's going one way if it hits a few feet the other way it's going the other way or it's going out of the park and so i at least can 
I could kind of understand the one that Boulder <laughs> dropped that, that made everybody mad mm-hmm. because there's a lot going on back there in left field. The others, I just don't. I And, and this is what I'm – I think, Billy, maybe it's not fair. I'm not the one out there playing. But it, it feels like this team is more – I don't know if fragile is the right word. You hate to to use that to describe kids who have succeeded in baseball their whole life because they got to this point by being mentally tough. Mm-hmm. But something is off there. The propensity, I feel like, to melt down mm-hmm. has been there the last – like you saw it, I think it first started that LSU series of 2022. Um, I, I didn't see that one. That's when I was coming right out of heart surgery. And so I, I didn't there. really see much yeah. of it. And I was, but I was looking at the scores and going, what is going on? Um, you saw it in Knoxville last year. It, you, you saw it and, and it just, it, it kind of felt like, like you said, Billy, as soon as you had dropped that fly ball and I was, I was in and out all weekend, but I, I remember I couldn't watch the Sunday and people were just talking about, I was watching the game thread. And I'm looking, it's tied at two or, or the, the score tracker. Mm-hmm. And it's like uh, error on center fielder and, and three runs score. I'm like, what? And then I saw the play yeah. later and you saw Laniv do that. I mean, that that's not a, that's not an ability thing. That is a between the years thing. And that's what concerns mm-hmm. me. I know people say, Hey, look, um, Corbin just needs to yell at him more or use the bench. But like, I think that's where they run into issues because you don't want to kill a kid's confidence. And and I, if a player's fragile, I don't think yelling at him is gonna, yeah, gonna serve a purpose. So that Luke, I'm gonna direct this to you. I don't know what they do here. Well, <clears throat> let's let, let's just go back to last night. We have a we have a, a two kids. One had an ERA over seven that pitched against us. The other one was near ten. We strike out twelve times against Valparaiso last night. Twelve times we strike out. That's that's acceptable. In a, that's SEC. a team that's pressing. Yeah, but you don't do that in a midweek game against Valparaiso. I'm sorry. And Unless then the Florida <laughs> McIlvain's <laughs> off Austin Fort on the pop up, and that McIlvain is calling for the ball. Which really, honestly, Austin Ford's first game he's ever played in college in the field was that was last night. Yeah. So I kind of give him a pass. Michael yeah. Vaney called it the way he did. He should have called it. You know. Instead, he turns and looks at Austin Ford like, "Why didn't you call me off?" See, so there's a communication breakdown. And and let me ask you this, Chris and Billy. You know, we we talked about this earlier, and Coach Corbin's uh, uh, relate has said this. We got guys that can play multiple positions. Yeah. Hey, is there a little bit too much of that? And what I mean by that is yeah. it's, RJ Austin is not comfortable at first base. No, clearly. He, he's not instinctive, you know, just doing things that a first baseman does naturally. It doesn't come natural to RJ. No. He's might make a play or two that the other first baseman wouldn't make, but the routine play is not easy for him. And Luke, you, I want to follow. I want to follow up on something you said when you're done. Okay. So when you when you have that, and then the next inning he's playing center field, and then you got to communicate because now you've moved another guy into right field, and then you took mm-hmm. the right field and moved him to left field. You the communication part of that breaks down, I think, at some point. And I'm not being critical of Corbs. My God, he's uh, thought uh, he's forgotten more baseball than I'll ever know. But at the same time, sometimes maybe there's too much of that moving around junk. And one other thing I want to say, and then you can take it, Chris. How can a guy like Alan Espinal, who was tearing the cover off the ball, hitting breaking balls, sliders, anything they threw, he can't touch anything. He's striking out. He struck out like nine times in the last 14 at-bats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I understand slumps happen in baseball. But, man, alive. It's just like it's something happened. It's like there was an incident. You know. Yeah. I was texting with somebody last night who knows that program very well. I said, what, what is up with Austin at first? And he said, I just think that is Tim trying to get the best offense in there that he can. And that that's where that piece fit, but you're right. And, and I'm not, I'm not bagging on RJ Austin. 
And, no. and look, I think there's going to be some of this in center field. He was used to being an infielder, and he's got speed and things that play out there in center. But I mean, it wasn't it wasn't flawless the first couple of weeks when that's where he was either. Right. Uh, now, look, we are beyond spoiled because we were used to watching a a guy in Enrique Bradfield Jr. I'm convinced you put him in the majors today, he'd win a gold mm-hmm. glove in center field. He was that good. He may have been the most elite defensive outfielder I have ever seen in the Southeastern Conference. Uh, yeah. If there's another one that's close, you, you give me a name because I don't know who it would be. So, but I, th- I think the issue you hit on it, Austin is just not instinctive at first. Okay, Austin Fort made a mistake last night, or I mean, Austin Fort got pulled not long, I think, after that for for Austin. But all right, let, let's rewind this a minute, okay? It's all easy to say, well, this is the first baseman's ball, and you need to do this or you need to do that. Like I've I've had this happen to me before. Like I'm driving, and I see somebody in front of me break. And my my wife yells out me, um, and she panics like she doesn't think I see the car. And I've already gone to hit the brake, but I like freeze for a second because I got this thing over here I'm not expecting. Yes, and I know mm-hmm. what to do if you say, Chris, what do you do when the car hits the brakes in front of you? Well, you do what I'm already doing. But then when something happens, it startles you, and I don't know if you know, McIlvain was cutting in front of him, looked like he wanted the ball. We all make decisions in a split second that if we had time to go back and rewind, of course we wouldn't do it that way. But the minute you hesitate for something that you're not expecting, like a pitcher running in front of you to catch a ball in foul territory, when you're cutting one way, all of us are capable of freezing in the moment. What I didn't understand with pulling Austin Fort in that spot is I think that's a mistake any of us can make. R.J. Austin, again, love love the guy, needs to be in the lineup everywhere someday, somewhere. We have seen him make, like, anytime a ball is hit to first base, you just hold your breath because you don't know, you know, there's going to be hesitation with somebody covering the bag, if he's going to break one. I mean, it's just, it's not instinctive to him. Last night, he didn't get charged with an error, but there was the play on the ball that Diaz threw to the home plate side of first base. He's over there right in the baseline and gets the ball knocked loose. Like, if you got a taller first baseman, they reach more towards third base than they do down the line because they got more of an arm to deal with. I mean, it's just a constant. Well, it, it's and, just, it's a constant set of things that come up because it's just not the right fit. And I think you, you've got mm-hmm. to settle that with somebody, give Holcomb a chance, give us a chance. Oh, by the way, look at where they stand in the power standings these days in the SEC. You got some teams that have hit over twice as many home runs than they've hit. That's starting to be an issue. Feels to me like you can solve that issue with guys that are used to playing there and can also help you with the power. I think Austin needs to be in the outfield. I think Humphrey probably needs to be in the outfield. I don't know what you do with the other spot, but I think that's an answer that they need to get to. Uh, one more thing about the play you're talking about with Austin, and, and this goes back to being instinctive. He caught the baseball, but instead of just making the tag on the guy, he tries to find the bag. Yeah. He can't get the bag, and then he drops the ball because he's not, he's looking at the bag. You know, that's just not playing the position with confidence. Yeah. And, and I've mentioned this before. When we go into the hitting slumps, we feel like we're squeezing the sawdust. If we were having using wooden bats, we're squeezing the bats. You can tell that with the strikeout. There's no confidence. The aggression is gone that they were playing with early in the year. Now, yeah, we'd won 14 in a row, and we were due to play a, a bad game. Well, we played a bad game against Belmont, but we won. But then we go to South Carolina. It's just, it's like we we just haven't had a practice yet. It was it was very poor. Um, I know everyone's frustrated, and, and hopefully starting tomorrow it'll change. But uh, one other thing, Chris, I want to mention while we're on here, prayers for Mike Baxter and his family. Yeah. I want to mention yeah. that. When, when did he lose his father? I, I did not realize that had happened until after the series. Well, he, he was not at South Carolina, so I, I don't know if it happened the night of Belmont or the day you know day after. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I love Mike as, as a person. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. I know he been, and how isn't that funny? The, the hitting's been better than anybody expected. Your hitting coach leaves for a weekend, and yeah. the, your hitting falls apart. So, anyway, ready for the mailbag? Let's do it. 
Uh, you All get right. the questions ready. I'll do the reads. The mailbag is brought to you by Sutherland and Belk, a family owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call, 615 846 6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Mailbag also presented by John Levin and the Maynard Nexus Government Contracts Group, which advises government contractors on all aspects of their needs with a proud focus on matching legal solutions to business needs. All right, Billy, get us started. All right, let's start with Dylan VU. Are y'all hearing anything about Byington's staff or transfers in? Um, first on Byington's staff, uh, heard from somebody that uh, current VMI head coach, Andrew Wilson, who used to be a lead assistant at James Madison, uh, could be a lead assistant for Byington at Vanderbilt. Just keep an eye on him. Uh, he's actually the head coach at VMI right now. Uh, John Cremens, I would guess. Um, and Luke, I think he's the son of Bobby Cremens there. Right. Uh, really, yeah, really tight with, uh, with Byington. Of course he was, he was an assistant with him at James Madison. I would guess, you know, he, he moves over. Um, and a guy that I think they sh probably should retain, or at least try to is James Strong. James Strong was retained by Stackhouse even when, uh, you know, when he was with Bryce Drew and he's kind of been here and done that. Um, you know, I'm not saying he needs the biggest role, but just for familiarity and, you know, to meet with Bonten and, and kind of lay out, hey, here's what we've done. Here's where we've been. Here's kind of our personnel. I think he'd be good with that type of stuff and even recruiting if they want to retain some of the guys uh, in their class. But that's really all I've got uh, on, on the staff. Um, and then transfers in, there's a kid, Terrence Edwards Jr., uh, who is at who, who was at JMU, entered the portal. Uh, he's going to have a ton of interest. Uh, he also declared for the draft. Um, so, we'll, you know, we'll see what he does. He's a really good player, six foot six, long guard. I've heard Wisconsin, Michigan State are in the mix there. Um, Vandy needs to get him. They, they, they need him, and that would be huge early. They also got have a kid, uh, Carey, uh, Jalen Carey, who's actually the younger brother of Vernon Carey, who played at Duke, is actually in the NBA mm -hmm. right now. Uh, watch out for him, Jalen Carey, a kid out of Florida that Byington recruited. He, you know, he was at JMU. I would say those two guys are guys to watch for. Other than that, Portal's so such a mess right now. I'm not even going to really try to 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 see who they might try to get. I know there's a couple Belmont players out there. You know, we've had people on our board bring up Malik Dia. We'll see. But Chris, Luke, I don't know if y'all have anything on the staff or or transfers in. Just the two you mentioned, and then I, I agree with you on James Strong. It's always good to have somebody to know where the paper clips and post-it notes are. So you yep. always have one guy, you know, at least for bodies. A, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always somebody for a year. I think he will do that. I think he'll retain somebody off that staff. I mean, good grief. There was what? How many people were on that staff? Uh, wow. 19. A lot. 19? Is that what it was? Yeah, I mean, that's you might. You, that's uh, that's that's Fire. about uh, less than 0.5 wins last year per staff member. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that happened. You know, somebody will show up. It's kind of like off the. I don't know if anybody watches Seinfeld, but you just show up at the office like you belong to work there. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you think if somebody was missing, anybody would have known? You know, no. just two people didn't show up, and not for a week or two. <laughs> oh man! Or would there have been any consequences? <laughs> God, there were some Never stories not. that came out of. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh man. Okay. I, by the way, I was just throwing that out there. I don't have info on guys not showing up for staff meetings, but <laughs> with with what happened, you just never know. You never know. Uh, okay, door fan six. How do you think this coach will be with former players and fans? From what I've heard. Uh, talk to somebody last night. I think everyone's going to be really encouraged with how he I wonder is in the who community. you talked to last night, Billy. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Um, <laughs> I think I think people are going to love how he interacts with with the community with former players. Um, and I already talked about how important that is. Uh, with with players itself. I, I mean, we've heard he's a players' coach. Um, and and. Yeah, I know Ezra Magnone called Stackhouse a player's coach. I think most a lot of players want to be able to call their coach a player's coach. 
I think they'll really be able to do that with Byington. And there was a good quote um, in, uh, I think it was Joe Rexroad's story uh, of, from <clears throat> from Terrence Edwards. And he just says, he's got, he's got tricks up his sleeves. You know, he's, he, you know, you know, he's always got a plan defensively. And um, I, I think, I think, I just think he's a guy that players will want to play for. So uh, in terms of former players though, guys, we, we've talked about it. I think, I think he'll be just fine with, with guys like that. Well, I'm on a, email, a text chain with seven former basketball players and a couple other goofballs. And we've had a great time this last, month or so figuring this all out. I, I think judging from just that text chain that he's going to reach out. Yes. You know, active about this, and which is a great sign. You know, Kevin Stallings, when he first got to Vanderbilt, was heavily involved in the group called the Rebounders back then. Hmm. I remember there would be 30 or 40 guys show up when they honored the Rebounders every year. That's gotten down to where there's four or five guys that were involved, if that. So that, that I think you'll see that immediate, immediately surge back up. I, I, uh, I again, I'm I'm uh, over the moon with this guy so far. Yeah, again, we haven't played a game, we haven't done anything. I may be totally different here in a few months, but uh, just the anticipation of the, how hard he's going to work and how he's going to hit the ground running and doesn't have any any plans to go play golf or go to Disney World or none, nothing else uh, that excites me. Yeah, I've got some very good early indications on all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nash Native 615, with NIL and transfers pretty much unregulated, how quickly could Vanderbilt rebound from this low point of Jerry to beginning uh, to being a competitive team? That's a really good question. Um, we've seen it at Ole Miss with what Chris Beard did last year. I know they didn't make the tournament, but he was able to buy, according to Jerry, the best team money could buy. I don't – that's obviously wasn't true. They 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 ended up being a pretty average bunch. I mean, they – they you know, he, hot start. Um, but you look at that and you say, okay, Chris Beard did that. They didn't make the tournament, but that's a heck of a year one. Um, you know, Dennis Gates last year, a great example of from the school he came from, brought in a lot of his guys, and they ended up making the tournament. But year two, 0 and 18. So I think there's a risk-reward type with that. Um, you know, but I think a, a, a good thing to this is that Byington has been in the business for a long time. He's got relationships in this industry. So, you know, I don't know that he brings in a stud, a stud portal class. Uh, I don't know that he has to, you know, Luke, you talked about it five years, you know, th this is, let's look at this as a five-year plan. I don't think this has to be a, a, a grand slam year one where they make the tournament. I mean, Maybe, maybe Byington is looking at this as immediate success. Uh, it, it's a, it's just a little bit harder to do that at Vanderbilt. I, I am interested to see, you know, Stackhouse also said after that Ole Miss loss, Vanderbilt doesn't get junior and senior transfers. He, he point blank said that. Well, Byington's got a chance to prove him wrong on that, and I'm interested to see that um, because he's going to have to. You're going to have to get veteran portal guys, you know, if you have immediate success. Now, you know, he could go after some sophomores, uh, you know, some guys, but, but that's not what, to, what it takes to get Im have immediate success. Um, I don't know what y'all think. That, that's a really good question. Just about ha can Vanderbilt have immediate success through the portal with their NIL resources right now under Byington? <clears throat> well, I, I'm a little different than you guys probably on this. I feel like you can get really good, really fast because if you, if you get two kids that can fill it up from three, and add some athleticism. Let's just say you find two kids. I'm no names. You know, Dalton Connect was is better than Tennessee thought he was going to be. Okay, they knew he was going to be good, but he he was not great at Northern Colorado. Mm -hmm. But they, they coached him up, got him better on the defensive end a little bit, and his confidence being able to score from all three levels just blossomed. And look what it's done for Tennessee. You know, they, they would probably be out. Texas would have beat them without Dalton Connect the other night. So if yeah. you get kids that are difference makers shooting the basketball, then you throw in – I'm not sure if they're going to stay or not, but if you throw in a athletic JQ and a Vin Allen Lubin and one other guy with those with two great shooters, you can win up to 18 games or something like that right away. That's my opinion. 
the reason I, I laughed about the best team money can buy comment was that Stack would have been doing the same thing if there were enough people that liked him, and, and that was that was his fault. But Luke, I, I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was because of the NIL environment. And I think the buy-in, and I think as Mark Byington gets out there and does more of his diligence and meeting people, I, again, I think you got people that are so starved for success, they're going to be lining up for him to help him out. Now, the issue is the admissions thing. And let's say that your pool is half of what everybody else is in the league is, either through the transfer restrictions or not qualifying there academically or whatever. Okay, let, let's say that there's a pool of 100 guys SEC teams, everybody else in the SEC is going for. Let's say your pool is 50, and I'm just making numbers up here. Okay, I can then start to hone in if I'm doing my diligence. I can get more on those 50 if I'm putting in the time that everybody else has to study the 100. So it's still a disadvantage, but there's a way that you can maybe make it work for you, I would think, if if he's smart. And from everything I hear, he's really smart. Yep. Uh, okay, ML Door 2 Any news on how guys are looking so far in spring practice? I've been a little under the weather, uh, but the hope was to go to more practices than I have so far. I'm going to try to go Thursday. Um, I'll be I'll be at Vanderbilt basically all day Thursday. Um, Nate Johnson looks uh, mobile, of course. I mean, again, it's hard. It's hard. You know, when we sit up in the balcony, and, and you know, we we don't get a great look at guys. Um, I like getting there early and and kind of watching the guys stretch and throw and warm up for about the first 30 minutes. Johnson's got a clean release, uh, good mechanics, uh, everything's smooth. And, and the way he runs, too, um, I, I thought that stood out. Berlowitz has the most impressive arm on the team right now. Um, just seeing him throw, a lot of the quarterbacks weren't extremely accurate. Uh, but I look at Berlowitz, and that ball flies out of his arm. Um, and then in terms of Randon Fontenet. I looked at Randon Fontenet. I didn't realize he was number 14. I look at number 14 and I go, who is that? And I look at my, you know, I kind of told myself, I was like, is that Fontenet? And I look at the roster, it's Randon Fontenet. And I go, wow, that's a big, long kid that looks like he could play right away. Um, almost like a guy like a, like Will, you look at Will Shepard, he stands out. But it, there's not as many guys that stand out. It's almost like a lot of them. You know, they got into year four now, and a lot of them are like that now, whether it's Fontenet, Dante Carter, Bryce Cowan is huge. I mean, C.J. Taylor, it's like, okay, they've got some athletes now, and it's not just one or two guys standing out. You kind of look at the hole now, and you go, okay, they're, they're bringing their guys in, and this is, you know, being year four, this is these are Clark and Barton's guys now, essentially. I mean, I know there's still some holdovers, but I looked at, uh, looked at that first – Warm-up session, I told somebody, man, they, there's some athletes out here. So, again, it's hard to take away a ton. Uh, that's what I'll say so far. I know, Luke, I don't know if you've been able to go yet, um, but that's what I've got. So, And, again, I'll, I'll probably try to be there Thursday. No, I'll be there either tomorrow or Friday, but uh, I have a house mouse that gives me a practice report every day. I know he's, he's uh, tired of me calling him. But, anyway, <laughs> two things that I'm taking from early – first four or five practices. Number one, I'm glad Diego Pavia is not here yet because this gives you plenty of time, plenty of reps for Berlowitz, Dickey, and Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, three kids will battle it out, be ready to go in the fall. Now, Pavia is going to come in already ready, I think. And I think that's a good thing because now he'll be, you know, he'll jump right into the fray. The other thing is it's amazing the confidence that you get from a few weeks in the weight room to transform your body. If you, and, and I said it the other day about Quincy Skinner, the way he looks now, go look at a video you did with an interview with him last year and look at now. And, and mm -hmm. it, five or 10 pounds of muscle can, can mean a lot of difference in your confidence and yeah. how you play the football field. So uh, I'm going to give the strength coach a lot of credit for uh, the way they're flying around and the way they look physically. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Papa Hick for VU. If you were the baseball coach, what, if any changes would you make as it relates to starting lineup, given how poorly this team is playing, particularly from a defensive perspective? Wow. There's a lot of options. You can go there. Um, I'll go defensive perspective. I'm with you guys on RJ Austin. Um, I just think he fits a little bit better in the outfield, but who do you put it first? 
You know, are you going to start Braden Holcomb, who's hitting below? He's hitting like .76 right now. He's really struggling at the plate. Austin Fort, you know, they gave him a shot. He made that error. Um, it's just tough right now because you've got you don't have a you don't have a clear first baseman right now with Maldonado out. Um, I would still go, try to put RJ Austin in the outfield somewhere, and then you look at first base. Maybe you go with Austin Fort. Um, it's just hard right now. Outfield wise, I think you're fine. I mean, Hewitt made that error. He hadn't really made an obvious error like that all season. Uh, Lanive, of course, made an error. I think I think he's a better option than Bulger out and left. Um, and then infield wise, Vastine and Diaz have made some uncharacteristic mm -hmm. mistakes as well. Um, I don't think I would make a ton of defensive changes. Espinal is still playing well defensively at catcher. Uh, lineup wise, I think the order is fine. I mean. You know, we saw Bulger leading off to begin the season, but he got hurt. I don't think he's back in the leadoff spot. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to give Tim Corbin advice here if you, if you were the baseball coach. Um, I don't know if you guys would say anything different there. Well, <clears throat> my concern is where's Cam Kozel? I know he's got yeah. a sh shoulder, but that guy to me is probably the best pure hitter on the team, mm -hmm. and they need his bat in the lineup. I don't know whether it's physical or what or just choice, but obviously he's not ready to play, or I think Espinal would have gotten the night off last night instead of DH. Um, as far as positions on the field, guys, look, if, you, if, if you're going by performance of the last five or six games, you'd bench every one of them, even Davis Diaz, who I think is one of the best defensive third basemen you could ever see. But last night he made two boneheaded plays. I mean, it's just like it's a, a disease that hit them all at once. Now. Mm -hmm. It'll end. It, I, I just think maybe, you know, we got too excited about the sweep at Auburn against Auburn and maybe we're too uh too down on them after the performance at South Carolina. There's there's confidence and there's ability. I think you've got ability on the left side of the infield. And even Jaden Davis has been fine. I think that was a concern. He's been like it's funny if you said they're going to have a major defensive issue somewhere, I would have said second base. That's where the least of their problems have been. Yep. Austin just is not an instinctive first baseman at this point. Um, they they could use a center fielder who can cover some ground. I I think he and Humphrey have got to be out there. Um, I don't know what you do with Hewitt. Maybe he's your left fielder. Maybe Leneve and Bulger are your DHs. I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't think Calvin Hewitt and is going to continue dropping fly balls. I really no. don't. Um, so if you can narrow that down and find a four, I think I'd just throw Holcomb out there and give him a chance. I mean, he is he is at he is fairly athletic for a big guy. You're gonna have some instinctive mistakes, but you're you're getting those whoever you throw out there right now. One other thing, guys, I, we haven't mentioned here. You, you guys know Bulger's hurt again. Oh man, no, I didn't. Yeah, he South Carolina. He got hurt in Sunday's game. He pulled the hamstring again. Jeez. So he's. Uh, I'm. I'm always worried about a hamstring because they just never go away. Yeah, he he hurt it again Sunday, and he's out. I guess probably about the same length or more than last time. I don't know how how bad the strain was, but usually if you re-pull it, it's going to be at least the same amount of time you were out. Yeah. Injuries are they're starting to kill this team. Yeah, in this program, the last few years, really. Um, man, that's tough. Okay, we got a few more here. We got a lot of a lot of questions. In the mailbag. Um, S. R. Kane, how many players from this year's men's basketball roster do you think Byington retains for next season? Maybe you have some information. Maybe just your gut feeling. Um, I don't really have any information. Um, if I had a gut feeling, Tyrod Lawrence is interesting. Tyrod Lawrence is from Georgia. So is Terrence Edwards. Um, and I, I. I've heard they they know of each other. I'm not sure how close they are. Terrence Edwards is from Atlanta. Um, he was recruited during the COVID year by Mark Byington. Uh, he had no other Power Five offers. You would imagine Edwards and Byington are really close. You got to wonder: Did Byington ever recruit Tyron Lawrence? Um, what's the, what's the relationship there? I think Tyron Lawrence is a guy that, um, if you're Byington, you probably want to try to keep. I'm not sure how likely that is. Um, it's just hard. It's hard to tell right now. Colin Smith, I kind of doubt will be back. He's got a lot of interest um, because I, you know, I've always thought Colin Smith is a good player with a lot of, with some good potential if he stays healthy. 
Uh, but I think that's a guy you should keep. Van Allen Lubin, another guy I think you should keep. I mean, why not keep Van Allen Lubin? He started playing pretty well down the stretch. He's still just a sophomore, so you know you can kind of work to develop him. Guy like a Paul Lewis, uh, you know, don't think that's a guy you look at and say we got to keep. Isaiah West, same sort of thing. Mignon will not be back. I doubt Jordan Williams will be retained. Uh, Evan Taylor will not be back. Uh, Malik Presley, interesting. We'll see what what they think of him. Uh, Kamateros, I, I, I don't, I don't think he'll I think be he's back. Done, he, he's a grad. He? Yeah, I think he's done. Um, Jason Rivera Torres, interesting. He entered the portal a couple of days ago. We've heard about FAU in that mix. Does he follow Dusty May to Michigan? I, I know Dusty May has recruited Jason Rivera Torres before. We'll see. I think JRT is a guy that needs to be retained. JQ Roberts started to come on late. Does he? Did, does the staff like him? Lee Dort, what's the situation with him? So there's a lot of question marks here and a lot of decisions to, to be made from Coach Byington. But surefire guys that I think the staff should try to keep are Lawrence, Lubin, and, and Smith. I mean, I think they should try to. Guys that are retained from the roster, I'll go, man, I'll go four. I think I, it's hard to say, though, because I, you, know, you don't know how many walk-ons they'll keep, how many walk-ons they'll bring in. You're, you're getting recruits. You're also getting portal guys. So I'll go four. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you guys would agree there. Well, you got, you know, you got 13 man roster. So if you keep only four and you honor the three freshmen, that's seven. So it only leaves you room to have six new guys. Now, can he get six new guys? I, I don't know. So he may just for the first year, keep a couple of guys that under normal circumstances, he wouldn't have on his team just for depth purposes and practice purposes. Um, I have no idea what he's going to do yet. I think he's probably already watching film on Vanderbilt and who who uh, he'd like to uh, reach out to. Uh, I really do hope the Edwards kids co kid come with him because he's legitimate. He'd be a great player in the SEC. He'd step in and be a great player right away. He fits right into SEC basketball. So hopefully he'll come. But other than that, I'll have no clue. I'm just not sure how many people on this roster you, you shed a lot of tears about if they're gone. Vin Allen Lubin would be one. I know Tyron Lawrence got, how do you put it, thrust into the spotlight and then criticized all year because he was the poster child for this team, I guess, he and, and Ezra. I think a little bit of that was unfair. I think the hype train got out ahead of Tyron Lawrence based on a, a pretty good sample size of games late. And I, I think he was it, – it's like taking somebody and saying – this guy's our Friday night starter when really probably what he is, is he's a better guy to have on Sunday or a midweek or, mm. or maybe a, a two, you know, in the right spot on the right team. He just was miscast. If you can reset your expectations and say, all right, Tyron Lawrence is not some franchise player to build around, but you need nine guys who can play. I think he fits in the mix there somewhere. Other than that, I'd like to have Rivera Torres back if I'm them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Smith. looking at Paul Lewis. Yeah. Colin, but if he's healthy and who knows it's an Achilles, I mean, an Achilles kept yeah. Mike Sroka out for three or four years and he's a pitcher. He's not a guy who's having to jump off an Achilles mm -hmm. every time. Now I don't know the severity of injuries, but like I'm looking, Paul Lewis played 503 minutes and had a negative 0.2 win shares last year. That's really hard to do. Yeah. Um, so well, I just look at this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Isaiah West. West played 300 minutes, had a .1 win shares. Again, not the, the based on what these guys have done so far, uh, and I'm trying to find some per 40-minute stats because that tells me what it looks like when these guys play more. Isaiah West scored 7.7. .7, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll find. Well, it. and, and let, let me let me throw I, I, this I'm out there. I'm looking at per, I'm looking at per 40 minute stats because that gives you an idea of what a guy can do when he's on the floor. Um, okay, Isaiah West was a, a less than 10 point score per 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, was was an okay shooter, not a not a great. I did shoot 54 percent from three, so there's that. 
I, I think most of these guys are marginal guys. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of guys that if you if you ran a decent SEC rotation out there that, that's NIT, if if Smith's off the table with an Achilles or whatever, that, then your list is Rivera, Torres, Lawrence, and, and Lubin, and I don't see much else here that I'm – I mean, it might be West. Some guys get it better, but I'm not seeing obvious guys. In his last public press conference, Jerry Stackhouse – almost talked about how he set up this next head coach well and and that you know he said he said we he said we built it you know we we've built it the right way you didn't build anything this is a bear cupboard and so if you're Byington i think part of Byington is looking at this going oh you know what i, I you've got some pieces it's not completely bare but there aren't there's there's not a ton of young talent where you go Okay, I like this kid. I think he projects well. We're gonna keep him. And no offense to those kids. They, you know, like Isaiah West, he's a Nashville guy. He's it's probably a blessing for him to be able to play at Vanderbilt, but is he an SEC guard? I, I just I don't know. And Stackhouse recruited too many of those types of guys. And it and you're in the SEC, you've gotta you gotta hold up your end of the bargain in these with these recruits. So this is not the type of cover that I covered that I think Stackhouse might have portrayed in that press conference. Um, because we, we, Stackhouse, go ahead. I'm sorry. We're in the position that LSU was in two years ago when pretty much they wiped out their entire roster. So that could be what Coach Byington wants to do. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're looking for ways in which Jerry Sackhouse said he said, next guy up i mean you, you can't look worse than he did so the next guy looks better by comparison other than that i've got nothing because the roster is not good yeah. I, I don't think i don't think this roster could win the swag probably right grambling did beat them a couple years ago there, there was that <laughs> okay we, we got a lot of questions like i said uh, a few more here uh black outdoor how does the seven million dollar apparently uh, NIL budget that is being thrown around stack up within the SEC and nationally. Chris, I know I texted you a couple nights ago about this, just being curious. I would say that stacks up pretty well. Well, the the, the question is, what is $7 million? Is that an amount pledged right. over yeah. four years? I don't think that's an amount available right now for guys in the, the universe of players. Uh, does the $7 million include guys who were saying – Hey, I'm standing by if you need it. Is that cash on hand? I have a feeling it's more the latter than the former. You just never – NIL is just it, – it's almost like urban legend trying to figure out yeah. you know, where, where, where the degrees of truth and where is this all fiction. But everything seems to indicate they're in a decent spot and there's some enthusiasm. So I think if they do the right things, my guess is the money is there, but who knows. I mean, I, I I shouldn't say it like that. That that made it. I I think there's an appetite for a pretty good nil effort, and I feel reasonably confident based on what's been in the air. Go doors ninety four. What are your expectations for Byington's recruiting? Good question. Um, recruiting taking out taking the portal out because recruiting in the portal is a thing too now. I'll, I'll just say recruiting high school players because I think that's what he means. Um, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell right now. Uh, when Bryce Drew got here, I don't know that we could have predicted him landing Garland and Chateau and and um, you know and, and Neesmith and those guys. It's just hard to tell. I mean, I think, again, Chris, like you said, it would be better than the last guy because the last guy did not recruit well at all. Um, so at the very least, it would be better than that. Um, and Byington was able to get Terrence Edwards. I mean, and he's turned in, him into an NBA prospect. Jalen Carey, uh, a kid who was not recruited a ton out of Florida. It feels like he can find those diamonds in the rough. And Joey has brought this up, uh, being from Virginia and, and recruiting in that area a lot, the, you know, in Maryland and the DMV, and then, you know, Oak Hill and schools like that. Um, and then Atlanta. It feels like he's got good roots in Atlanta with Edwards coming out of Atlanta. He's dipped into Florida getting Jalen Carey. So, uh, again, hard to tell so far. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any indications on what his uh, his recruiting will be like. No, I, I have no idea. I don't think any of us do yet. So, yeah, 
I, I have heard that he has recruited the southeastern footprint extremely well and is is just ready to plug into that. So that's pretty encouraging. I'm sorry. The one thing I do know, he has connections up near DC and and when he yep. was at Virginia at the at St. Anthony's and uh, the Matha and schools like that. That's an old kill. So that's that's good news. And in Nashville, and I think Chris Dorch talked about this. Get close with the academies, the private schools, the mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I know Drew Maddox isn't at CPA anymore. Either way, he'd be a good guy to talk to, have lunch with. Um, yeah, I know there's two former Vanderbilt players at NBA right now, uh, Ronnie McMahon and, and Kevin Anglin, guys like that, just building relationships with those high schools. So I think that's important. Um, let's see here. Uh, Vandy Man 1, will you guys be at, a, at the press conference tomorrow? Yes, I think we all will. Uh, I think Joey will be there as well. Um, it is open to the public, 4 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, is Candace going to try to take a victory lap? She should be accountable for that ridiculous buyout. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think that that's the kind of person Candace is. I mean, she's she does pretty well in in the public the public circles when 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 you know when the camera's on her and and, and you know look Candace she's 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 very personable. She's every time I've seen her she's she's super nice and and she's a She'll talk to you. You know, she's friendly. Um, I don't I don't see her necessarily having to take a victory lap there. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Chris? Uh, you know. Yeah. Keep it going. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, last one here. What is the status of JD Thompson and David Horn? JD Thompson, arm soreness, don't have a timeline. Uh, I, I did hear. I think Ari Gerson put out that that we could see him this weekend. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Not sure yet. David Horn. David Horn's a big mystery. Oh, he's I mean, fine. Okay. okay. Can he play so first base? Maybe. No, he, yeah, he pitched Sunday. He did well. He, he did fine Sunday. Can Can David play first base, uh, your son, Chris? Hey, he would He would give it a go. What about Oreo? Is Oreo pretty good? No, Oreo's scared of the ball. Uh, Oreo, when, when the ball's flying around the, the backyard, unless they're being thrown for him, he's he's out of there. <laughs> Come on, Oreo. I'm, I'm a little worried I've, I've, <laughs> to, to, to kind of give you the behind the scenes. There's a wall uh, this way as I'm pointing. I'm sorry, that way. Um, and I don't have a window, but our backyard's on, and I can usually hear him barking at whatever through the wall. I have not heard him. I'm a little nervous he's – Found a hole in the fence. Row, row. Yeah, I don't think right. he has. I think I think we've Oreo proofed it, but I'm a little I'm a little apprehensive. He's been outside for an hour and a half. All right, I know we got to get going here. We had a lot of questions. Last one, B three Vandy. What is Byington going to do to put fans back in the seats before our season begins in the fall? Uh, what kind of exciting things will Vandy fans see from a Byington coach team? Um, well, first question: Connect with former players. We've talked about that. I think he's going to do great at that. Um, number two, embrace Nashville. Embrace the, you know, the culture of, of Broadway. Get the people on Broadway over to Memorial. You know, uh, I, I think that that's Clark Lee has talked about that. Make it sort of connected with that, like like what the Preds have done at Bridgestone with Smashville. Um, you know, they, I mean, that's a fun product. They're playing well. They're winning, but they've done a great job of connecting kind of the culture there. I think. Memorial Gym. It should be entertainment. It's a it's a stage. You know, it should be packed uh, every every home game. Um, so just embracing Nashville, um, and also, you know, I I think just winning. You know, <laughs> like if you win games and don't, you know, avoid losing your first non conference home game. You know, I think at Byington that that should be pretty important to him. Embrace those <laughs> non conference home games. Because I think that's a first, that's a good first the preseason. So, Embrace the preseason. Yeah. Yeah. Beat the hell out of everybody. <laughs> hey, if I'm here, my first game is against Claremont Mud because I want to win that first one 100 to 50. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the cough. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I think that was it for, uh, for the mailbag. Oreo, where are you, Oreo? Oh man, no. if I have to chase that dog all over the neighborhood, I'm first of all, 
I'll get kicked out of the house, not him. <laughs> um, oh, Lord. Uh, you guys want to do parting thoughts? Starting with Billy. If Billy can get through the cough. Yeah. No, look, excitement. Um, you know, new start, fresh start, uh, just a new voice in here. And yeah. I think Thursday is going to be big for him and, and because the fans are going to be watching. You know, the fans are going to be watching live, trying to get a read of this guy, you know, trying to, you know, hoping he says something about Memorial. I think it's interesting. It's in Memorial. Stackhouses was in the, the media room. Uh, I mean, Bryce Drew's was in Memorial. There was excitement for Bryce Drew. This feels a little bit more like the Bryce Drew hire. Um, and, and knowing Byington, the kind of guy he is, he's still younger, full, you know, full of energy. He's going to say something that'll get the fans fired up. So, um, just, just excited. I mean, I think fans deserve to be excited. They deserve the right to, to look at this and and have hope, uh, because they haven't had hope for basketball in a while, other than, you know, the two month run last year. I thought Stackhouse's was at Legends. Oh no, never mind. That's I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I, I'm excited about the new hire. I think it was a home run, at least a triple. Uh. I think spring practice, I'm excited about getting over there again. I'm excited about Pavia not being here because the other quarterbacks getting all the reps. We'll see what we have depth-wise as well. And uh, the Vandy boys uh, hopefully will go back to the costumes they started the season in. And start costumes. <laughs> not uniforms, but costumes. Right, right. That interesting choice of words. Um, <laughs> yeah, hey, look. All I've asked for Vanderbilt for years is just run your athletic program like it is a serious Power 5 athletic program. It, it, it seems like since I've been doing this podcast, all I got is is Tim Corbin and nonsense. All, all you ask is to run a good process, make a good effort, find the right guy. Hey, good congratulations to Vanderbilt. I think they nailed it this time with the way they did it. I, I think there's a possibility – they nailed it with with who they got. But what I want at the end of the day, don't give me reasons to sit here and tell you at face value, they won. They made a mistake. I don't have those. The, the, the last time they did this, the guy they hired was literally out there playing golf that week when he should have been learning the rules. I'm not kidding. When he should have been learning the rules and rebuilding the roster. And, and that and a million other things, you knew it was not going to work right away which is why if you've watched and listened to this show, I was down on them from the beginning when everybody else was not because you, I knew enough about how the cake was being baked to go in. That, that is not going to work. You don't have it this time for the first time in a long time. I'm not dreading covering Vanderbilt basketball season. Um, and, and I'm actually a little bit excited to see uh, and interested to see what's around the corner. Yeah, and it's and been too that, easy for go you. Go ahead. It's it's oh, been too okay. easy for you to to nitpick. Just don't I put mean, it on a tee. Just don't put it on a tee for me, please. Um, yeah, that's that's where we are today. Well, thank you for watching and listening. Thank you to our sponsors, uh, Anchor Impact, The Wash House, Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company, Sutherland Belk, uh, the Maynard Nexus Government Contracts Group. Um, <laughs> For Luke White, Billy Derrick, I'm Chris Lee. I'm going to find Oreo. Hopefully that turns out well. Until then, we'll see you next time.